Good morning, good morning. We're going to do something a little different today. So could all the kids of Bedrock actually come to the front right over here, to the front stage? All the kids come take a seat right here, and as they're gathering up, come on, come on, come on. Uh, hello. In case you couldn't tell by the hair, I am not Buck. Um, my name is Brody. I help out with Kids Rock and youth and a couple of other things here in Bedrock. Um, and today, we have something special planned. So, oh, kids, actually, could you all turn around and look at me real quick? Hi. Most of you guys recognize my face. Here's the thing. I need your help today. We're going to do something special. How many of you have heard of the story of David and Goliath? How many of you heard? Good. Fantastic. That's great. Here's the thing. Some of these adults may not know the story. So can I get four volunteers to come on stage and actually help me tell the story? Raise your hand if you want to come on up, and I'll go ahead and pick. So we'll go with one. We'll go with two, uh, three, up oh, right there, three, and okay, we'll have both sisters, four. So if I point it at you, come on up stage, and then everybody else take a seat right there. Come on over here if you were chosen, right this way. Oh, ladies, over here. Hi, come over here. Fantastic. So they're going to help us out today. We're going to get to learn their names, and then they're each going to have their part. So could you tell everyone what is your name? Jamie. Hello, very nice. And what is your name? Germany. Fantastic. What's perfect is that they are sisters, and so now you two will get to play the sisters, and you guys are going to stand actually right where you are. Stand right there. Look pretty. You're doing great. Fantastic. And what is your name? Lila. Lila is going to play Saul. So, Saul, come right over here. You're going to stand right here, and Saul, you have to wear your armor. Do you think you can put that on? It's heavy armor. Get ready. Oh, oh, and the other side. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. It fits you just right. And of course, last but not least, in a story of David and Goliath, you need David. So, David, could you tell everyone your name? Mason. So, if you could join me right over here, we're going to show you guys the story of David and Goliath. There we go. You see, David was the youngest son of his family. And at the time, the Jews were at war with a people called the Philistines. And so David's father... Jesse sent him to visit his siblings on the battlefront. Come and visit your siblings. And to give them some food. Give them some food. Hey, siblings, there's your food. But the sisters were not happy that David was there. Look very unhappy. <laughs> Good job. And in fact, one sister said, why are you here? Huh? <laughs> Say, why are you here? Why are you here? And the other said, you're a little kid. You're a little kid. I don't know about that, but. <laughs> you see, the Philistines had a champion, a great big bald giant named Buck, I mean Goliath. <laughs> and you see, Goliath would come each day into the valley and insult the Jews. You puny little Jews, I will crush you. Oof. And all of the Jews were very scared. Quick, sisters, look very scared. <laughs> Great job. But David was actually mad. Look mad. Hey, got the Hulk muscles. Uh, because he knew that God was stronger than anyone else, and yet everybody was scared. You see, Saul the king of the Jews, heard about David and the courage that he had. And so David was brought before Saul. Do, 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 do. <laughs> right here. There you go. Saul asked David, why do you think you can beat Goliath? Why do you think you can beat Goliath? And David said, because God always wins. Because God always wins. And with that, Saul tried to take their armor and put it on David. Try and put your armor on David. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But David threw it on the ground. He knew that he didn't need that armor. In fact, all he needed, good job, was a stone, a sling, and God. And so he took this and he went and he met Goliath in the valley. And at that, when the giant saw the small boy approaching, he yelled out, 
You come to me with sticks? Oh, and in response, David said, You come at me, uh, <coughs> <laughs> you come at me with a sword, but I come in the name of the Lord. The battle is uh, him. <laughs> and with that, David took his sling, spun it around his head, and around, and around, and hurled his stone at Goliath, <laughs> and struck Goliath down. <laughs> and that day, the Jews were victorious. Give our kids a round of applause. Thank you very much. All the kids of Kids Rock, you may now go over to the normal Kids Rock time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, good morning, good morning. What a good way to start the morning. Thank you, kiddos, as they head to Kids Rock. My name's Buck. I'm one of the elders here. I'm trying to organize myself. It's tough being Goliath and Buck. So um, we are starting a new series this morning, as Jeremy said, and it's entitled Deeper. And, and during the summer, we want to look at stories that we're very familiar with, and we want to look at them and, and, and just see what maybe we've missed or maybe something we've forgotten. And, and our goal with this series is, is just simply to take a closer look at the passages from the Bible that we're familiar with, especially from our childhood, and see what we can learn from them today. But before we do that, if you want to participate, we're going to do a little quiz. And the way this quiz is going to start is I need you, if you're participating, to stand up. Because basically it's this. You're going to stand up until you don't know an answer. All right? If you don't want to participate, that's fine. But if you're participating, now is the time to stand up. All right? No one's participating. This is going to hurt my feelings. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here's the game. It's not going to be silly. It's simply... A quiz. You're going to see a line on the screen. When you see the line on the screen, if you know what movie you believe it's from, stay standing. All right? If you don't know the line, just sit down. All right? So let's see the first line. First line, if you build it, they will come. If you believe you know what movie that's from, stay standing. All right? Wow. Wow, all right. All right, our next line. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Did we lose anybody on that? All right, we got some movie buffs. Next line, beam me up, Scotty. All right, wow. I can't trip any of you up. All right, next line. Luke, I am your father. All right. All right, you guys ready for the answers? Let's go back to the first one. Our first line was, if you build it, uh, they will come. And what was the movie? Field of Dreams, right? The only problem is you all missed that. Because the line is, if you build it, he will come. Ah, so... You guys can all sit down because you know where this is going. <laughs> you know where this is heading. But let's just look at the next line that we had. We had mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Snow White, of course. Of course, I went with the original cover. What was actually said? Magic mirror. Oh, some of you are on it. The actual quote is magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? All right, next line. Waiting for it. Beam me up, Scotty. This one blew me away because I've said this so many times in my life. And I'm not a Trekkie, but it just, I thought that's what they said. But what did they actually say? They actually said, Scotty, beam us up fast. So that's the actual line. And of course, how many of you are Star Wars fans? How many caught this? I'm not a Star Wars guy at all. I had no idea, but we said, Luke, I am your father. 
But the actual quote is, no, I am your father. That's the line. You all failed, but <laughs> the good news in our failure is we have all learned something today. So we can go home knowing that we've learned something. Really, to illustrate what we're talking about is we're going to look at these stories this summer, and there's going to be these kind of things that we think we understand about the stories, the passages from Scripture. But as we dive in a little bit deeper, you see what I did there? We dive a little bit deeper, we're going to see that these are more than just stories, but they're part of the story, God's story. And, and, and it's really important as we look at this is to understand that the scriptures tell an entire narrative of God's design and his ultimate plan to restore this broken world. And every story is a part of that. And that we're really excited about helping to maybe connect some of those dots for everyone this, this morning, but even throughout the summer. These are more than stories. In fact, I, I, I just kind of wrote this sentence down. This summer, we will see how God is magnified in every part of Scripture. We're going to be reminded that every part of Scripture is about the glory of God. And we're going to see how each line of Scripture is pointing us to a redeeming, ruling restoring Savior. Isn't that cool? That, like these stories, are, they're, they're not random. They're not, they're not stories of morality, but they're the story of God, of how he is going to use broken people, how he's going to redeem broken people, and that there's a real war that exists, and we're going to dive into that in just a little bit. This is such a true statement that Jesus himself in Luke tells us that all the stories of the scriptures, of the Old Testament specifically, are pointing to him. Luke chapter 24, verse 25 through 27. You don't have to turn there. You can. It'll be on the screen. This is Jesus talking. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, so very beginning, beginning with Moses, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus is saying, this is all about me. And we gotta remember that because if we're not careful, we can make this story, our story today, David and Goliath. We can make it about what giants are we facing today? And, and we'll make ourselves David. But we're gonna see today, they, we're not David David is a foreshadowing, a type that reflects Jesus. And so that's kind of the theme of this summer. This is what we're looking at. This morning, if there was a thesis statement, I would say it like this. It'll be up on the screen. David and Goliath provide an example of an all-powerful God using unlikely people in unlikely ways for an unlikely outcome, an outcome that only could be credited to God and his rule. Isn't that cool? Like God's the one that gets the credit. God's the one that gets the glory. So if you will, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is where we see the story of David and Goliath. And as you are there, as you're turning to 1 Samuel 17, I just had a thought. Could you imagine waking up this morning and you're in Ukraine? Could you imagine waking up, you're in Ukraine, and you just go about your day, and you never once think about the war that's happening. Like, that's crazy, right? Like, like, like might we say that's impossible for, for a Ukrainian to wake up and not even think about what is happening? It's impossible. What's happening, though, the reason I use this is, is as Christians, we're told clearly that there is a cosmic battle that is happening every single day. And unless, and, and, and unless we acknowledge it, we will literally just live our lives like nothing's happening. Like, like there's a real cosmic battle that exists. And my, my hope and my prayer this morning is, is maybe to help recalibrate, to maybe help us refocus on, you know what? There is a war, a cosmic battle that exists and many of the battles that we face, we think they're just happenstance. 
But the reality is that there is a real enemy of God who really desires to mess up God's plan. With that mindset, let's dive into 1 Samuel 17 a little bit here. In 1 Samuel 17, we're going to see some characters. Obviously, the big, the bad, the bald Goliath. Technically, I don't think he was bald. But that's all we have, right? So we have Goliath. And we know some things about Goliath. Um, First and foremost, the scripture, especially in verses 4 through 7, are going to talk about his appearance, right? So, so in Kids Rock this morning, all three rooms, there is a nine foot six inch Goliath on the wall. And nine foot six inches is really, we had to put a ladder to get it up, right? It is huge, right? So his appearance matters in the scripture. We're also going to see that his armor weighs 126 pounds. Like, this is a big man. The Bible says that his spear, the head of his spear is 15 pounds. All right, now there is full disclosure here, and I'm not one of those geeks, but I need to disclose it. There is a debate, was Goliath really nine feet, six inches? So here's how I'm gonna just discuss it. Our oldest manuscripts, all of our oldest manuscripts actually have him at about six foot nine. And you're like, well, why does my Bible say nine six? It doesn't, it uses cubits. But why do we come up with nine six? Because the translation that the English Bible is translated from has it at nine foot six. And now some may be like, aha, I knew the Bible was wrong. It's inconsistent. Very simple way to look at this. For me, there are different transcripts that we have that say different things. Height, for example, would be an example. For me, it doesn't attack, it doesn't threaten the truthfulness of the scripture because as far as I'm aware, as far as most scholars will acknowledge, any of those discrepancies do not change the meaning of the story. So for example, if Goliath is nine foot six or six foot nine, my question would be, how does that change the story? the outcome of the story. There's some nuances that are gonna change and I hope that we'll see that today. So I'm just saying that because I know there's some of you in here that be like, man, Goliath wasn't nine foot six inches. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. All right, so there you go. Was Goliath nine six or was he six nine? We don't know. But what we do know from the scriptures is that he was a big man. And his appearance, according to the scriptures, was, was a way of intimidating God's people. Now, we also look in verses 8 and 10 in 1 Samuel 17. You're going to see Goliath defying God and the people that God has chosen. This is really important to note in this story because what we want to understand is this isn't a random story of some big dude and some little boy that's a lamb or lamb, it's a shepherd that just happened to fight each other. Like there's a big story happening here. And so Goliath, he starts to defy God. God. And he does this with great mockery. In fact, the the word that's used in this defiance means to mock God. And this is what Goliath does. And, And ultimately, this is what gets David so fired up. One, that God or Goliath is mocking God, but two, the people of God don't seem to care. David's like perplexed. If you will, just kind of, if you're a note person, go back and look at this today. But six times in chapter 17, Goliath makes direct attacks on God. And you'll see this in verse 10, verse 25, verse 26. He does it twice in verse 36 and verse 45. The reason why I want to highlight those is this is what this is about. This isn't Goliath going and attacking the Israelites and David's defending the Israelites. This is God, God, Goliath attacking God. And David, knowing who God is, knows that God is worthy of being praised. You see, the battle isn't David versus Goliath. The battle includes David and Goliath, but the battle is so much bigger. In fact, this battle, this scene, is rooted all the way back into Genesis 3. You're like, What's Genesis 3? If you're not aware, Genesis 3 is Adam and Eve. And we see Adam and Eve in the garden. And we see a serpent who deceives them. And that's how sin enters into 
this world. And you may be asking, well, how, what does that have to do with Adam and Eve and this story? Well, I'm glad you asked because context matters. There's a part of the story of David and Goliath that is incredibly huge. Wait, can I get this next picture up? Did you know there's mermen in the Bible? That's right. This guy right here, this is Dagon, or Dagon, Dagon, all right? Now, the story with Dagon is he's in the book in Samuel. You'll see him at the very beginning. He's also in one of the stories we'll be covering in a few weeks, Samson. Now, Dagon is the god of the Philistines, all right? Now, there's some things I want you to really look at as we look at Dagon. You see his scales, Many suggest that these scales and the way that he is, the man and the fish, represents even the scales of a snake in Genesis 3. What we're seeing is, we're seeing whether it's a snake, a serpent, what we're seeing is the Philistines weren't simply motivated by a land grab. They worshiped a god, Dagon, that was against the god. And that's where this battle exists. Like there's this intense battle. And, and, and just kind of for example, we look at Dagon. And by the way, Dagon is the father of Baal. And we all know Baal, right? So what I'm trying to say is this cosmic battle that started in Genesis 3 is continuing all through the Old Testament. And it, this is not a random story. And, and this continuing battle is going to run all the way through this book until we get to Revelation, all right? So, for example, we look at Dagon. We see him with Delilah and Samson. In Judges 16, 23, this is what happens. This is after Delilah has deceived Samson. Samson is captured, and look what the Philistines do once Samson is captured. Judges 16, 23. Now, the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, to celebrate, saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. They're saying, our God, the gone, is better than Samson's God. It's a cosmic battle. There's a real war that's occurring. Now, the, the thing that's interesting as Westerners, we have a tendency to personalize this story. And, and make, make no mistake, it is a personal relationship with God. It's personal, but it's not private, and it is also communal. You see that? And that's where a lot of people get stuck in their faith lives is they think it's just personal. But we're seeing through this whole story, it is God redeeming his people, and his people are fighting. And by the way, we're going to see how we fight differently, but are fighting and representing his kingdom into this broken world. That's what this cosmic battle is all about. But it wasn't just Samson. Remember King Saul? He's part of this story, right? Well, in 1 Chronicles 10.10, 10, we're going to see when King Saul is eventually killed by the Philistines, look what they do to him. 1 Chronicles 10.10, 10, they put his armor in the temple of their gods and hung up his head in the temple of who? Dagon. Again, the Philistines saying, our God, Dagon, gave us victory over the Israelite God, Yahweh. Our God is better than their God. You know how this becomes practical? I promise this is not just a history lesson. Every one of us today are tempted by this world to accept some other form of worship, some other God other than the God of all creation, right? Hey, I love sports. I'm not picking on sports. I go to games. But there's no mistake that in America, we have no problem making sure we're at the game on Saturdays and Sundays, right? Millions of people attending. I don't know if there's a God of football. I don't know. But, but I just want you to understand that we can kind of laugh at the man-made, man-made, man mermaid, whatever. We can laugh at, like, how dumb could you be to worship that? But let's just take a moment, each of us, and just think about the things that grab your attention, the things that grab your energy, and how you worship it. Now, you may not acknowledge it as worship, 
But what grabs your time, what grabs your energy, and what grabs your focus is what you worship. See, so this isn't some foreign story. This is part of this continuing cosmic battle. Saul faced it, Samson faced it, and now David's in it. You remember in 1 Samuel, the Philistines had beaten the Israelites and they captured the Ark of the Covenant? That whole scene, let's just look at it for a second. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, you'll read it, but just kind of a brief summary. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of the God, of, of God, they carried the Ark into whose temple? Dagon's temple. They carried it into his temple and set it beside Dagon. Dagon, here is the Ark of the Covenant. Here is what the Israelites value. It is yours because you are greater than their God. And what happens? The next day, Dagon, Dagon was fallen down, face down. So it was an accident. Philistines go back, put him back up. The next day, Dagon is back on his face, but this time his head and his arms are broken, and he's just there. You know what God's doing, right? The Philistines think Dagon is the God of gods. The God of gods, the one God, is telling the Philistines, even your God will bow and worship me. Amen? Like This is this world that we live in, this cosmic battle that's really happening. And, and this God, Dagon, is what has motivated the Philistines to fight the Israelites over and over again. So with that being said, we need to be reminded that all 66 books of this Bible, they go together to tell one story, one story. And that story is ultimately God's creation, man's rebellion, God's redemption, and God's restoration. That's what's going to happen. That is what we read from the scriptures. And now can you imagine, as believers, if you're a believer, could you imagine living your life understanding that you're a part of a cosmic battle? You've been redeemed from this enemy side of the battle. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, this just popped into my head. Um, today, I was talking to a buddy. Today is um, Ascension Sunday, right? So Ascension Sunday, right? The Holy Spirit comes down into the church in Pentecost, and, and, and we get the Holy Spirit, and we get excited like, hey, we got the Holy Spirit, and we should be excited. But what you got to understand is that ascension, that the Holy Spirit coming when Jesus leaves, he sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming, get this, right now there are Christians all around the world praising and worshiping God right now. Do you know what they all have in common right now? The Holy Spirit's in them. The Holy Spirit is a sign of God's kingdom coming to this earth. All around the earth right now, the Holy Spirit indwells every single believer. This is what's happening. God is going to redeem and restore this place. He's going to make it right. And, and let's be honest, Texas this week, like, like it's a cosmic battle. It's rooted in a war between God and the enemy. All of it is. And so we see that God is going to use his people. And he, and, he, and he uses these people because only a perfect, powerful God could use imperfect people. That's incredible to me. These two kingdoms are at war with one another. And we got to understand that Satan is powerful. Satan is real. But as I believe as Augustine said, even Satan is God, Satan. This battle is intense. It is real. And it manifests itself in so many ways. You get wronged. Like you're legitimately wrong. And you want to bow up. And you want to defend yourself. But then you hear your king, Jesus. And he says, pray for your enemies. See, this, this isn't morality. This isn't moral stories. This is how the citizens of God's kingdom fight in this cosmic battle. It's a different warfare that we use. Our weapons are different. The Philistines are representing Satan's assault on God's kingdom.
It's it's kind of pictured. We talked about Dagon and, and his scales, but but if you will, just just look at 1 Samuel 17, 5 real quick. So 1 Samuel 17, 5. I, I wanted to show you this. I don't think it's coincidence, and, and honestly, I'm not a scholar, but most biblical scholars don't. But but listen to this. This is describing Goliath. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and it, he was armed with a coat of mail. Does anyone else have a different translation? Does anyone have it where it says scales? Yeah, I see hands. All right. Some translations have scales. Many scholars believe that is, again, a reference back to Satan's representative rule, the serpent. It's just not coincidence. These details matter. It's a real war. Look with me. Let's look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So Goliath's been threatening them, and they're dismayed, and they're afraid. Could you imagine what would have happened if Saul, the people, would have just remembered the words from chapter 16, verse 7? You remember when, when they were looking for a king to replace Saul? And, 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 and they go, and they look at David's brothers, and man, he's, he's hands, man, that's the dude, the big guy. He's strong, nope, 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 and it gets all the way down to David. And what do we read in 16, 7? But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Man, it is so easy to be influenced by our circumstances. It is so easy to be influenced when you don't have the job and you start to question your value. It's so easy to be influenced by your circumstances that you forget. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you forget who your father is and you begin to be reactionary and and you become like Saul and, and you become like the Israelites and you're afraid of what's happening in your life. King Saul, King Saul, if he was a pastor, he would have been the first guy in the pulpit. He was tall, he was good looking, he was charismatic, he was the man. And look, I'm not picking on churches, but look, you got a good looking, tall, handsome pastor. We can't do that. All right, that was a cheap shot. But you get where I'm going. Like, like, like we need to see things the way God does. And by the way, me being good looking doesn't make me a bad person. It just can't be my identity, right? Maybe my vanity I need to repent from. But, but you see how this works. I want us to have another thought. You know how I introduced this idea that was Goliath 9'6 or was he 6'9? This is crazy. If he's 6'9, which most of our oldest transcripts say he was, when we look at Saul's description, we see Saul at about 6'5 or 6'6. Six, six. Now, all of a sudden, Saul, being afraid of this huge giant, now it comes like this. See, our fear can be because of a huge giant, but ultimately our fear is because of a lack of trust in God. That's what it was about. It was about a lack of trust in God. Saul's fear magnified, or was magnified, not because of Goliath, but because he did not trust God. How do we know that Saul didn't trust God? Well, look what he does. Look at, look at Saul's life pattern. Um, Dave Klaus showed this to me uh, earlier in the week. In 1 Samuel 14, 52, Saul, look how Saul picks his guys. In 1 Samuel 14, 52, there was a hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he attached himself to them. Saul just simply used his eyes and used the wisdom of this world to approach life. And if we're not careful, we will do the same. We will use the wisdom of this world to make decisions in our circumstances. And we'll try to figure out why is this not working? Why is this not happening? Saul himself admitted that he was easily influenced by people. 1 Samuel 15, 24, he said this, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, 
because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Man, fear. Fear. If uh, some of you may know that SBC, they're having their issues as, as a convention. I was reading through the report, and you're reading these things on these assaults. And what's incredible to me was people were afraid to address the issue. And, and, and I get the fear, but, but doesn't righteousness matter? Doesn't truth matter? It does matter. We got to remember that. But it could cost me my job. It could cost me my family. It could cost me my reputation. And all I hear is Jesus is calling, saying, if you're going to follow me, you must lose your life. But in losing your life, you will find it. It's going to be a statement. It's going to be a matter of faith for us. Let's just think about this a little bit. What does it mean to trust God? Psalm 23, 4, I love this. We all know Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Mm. God's a good God. He's so good to us. He's so patient and kind. So what does this look like practically? I mean, the nation of Israel is a reminder of how unbelief is always manifested in fear. Are you a fearful person? Right now, right now, what are you afraid of? Do you have a biblical teaching or a principle in which you're addressing that fear? Or is it just like, ah, I hope this works out? That, like, what I want to encourage you, church, is, is this story, the whole scripture, is God's story of this whole cosmic battle. And everything that you're going through is a part of this cosmic battle. My encouragement to you is to understand how the conquering king writes the story. Right? Instead of aimlessly, like, uh, I don't know what to do. But, but to have some confidence from the good God, the all-powerful God, and some ways to approach this. We see this in Matthew 6.33. You talk about this cosmic battle. You see this kingdom talk. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness. And Jesus says, all these things, food, clothing, and sheltering, I will take care of if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Man, what a relief. You mean God, all I have to do is live for you, follow you, live by faith, and you'll take care of those details? Thank you. Thank you, God. And I know some of you may be like, well, no, you gotta be responsible. Here's the cool thing about living for Jesus. By faith, you are responsible. You do responsible things. It's not a blind faith sitting around doing nothing. Man. David, we see him, this David, the one we kind of give all this credit to. And we make the story about David. He's a shepherd boy. Here's what we know about David. He trusted God. This morning, I want you to understand this. Number one, God is faithful. Look with me, if you will. Verse 26 through 27. God is faithful. Look at what we read. And David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Man, David, he, he, he had a faith and a confidence that there is a good God that is victorious, that will not be mocked by other gods, who will not be mocked by other people. That was David's understanding. We need to understand this as Christians. As Christians, we must live a life with a theocentric compass. Theocentric just simply means we're going to make it about God. We must have this theocentric compass, meaning God truly leads and directs us. Our words, decisions-making, and motives are submissive to God. Unfortunately, 
Many who profess Christ give little to no consideration as to what they say or do, and as a result, there is no evidence of the living God in their lives. Listen, the Philistine army, I mean, the Israel army had no evidence of God in their lives. They were fearful. They were terrified. David knew that God was always faithful. David also knew that God was always victorious. Look with me at verse 37. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear would deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord will be with you. Can I tell you something that's about faith? I mean, like, not, not believing a set of facts faith, but I mean, people who live by faith, it's contagious. <laughs> I mean, just think about how crazy this is. Saul's terrified. Here's David said, hey, I killed a lion and a bear because God was with me. God will be with me here. And Saul's like, okay, go for it. Faith. I just want to encourage you, church. God can be trusted. God is victorious. And God has clearly given us a roadmap, a path, an understanding of how to follow him, how to live for him. And because he's given that, to us, we must remember that our faith is founded in his victory. That that, like God is victorious. All of our faith says that. In fact, Paul says, if Jesus does not come out of the grave, we're to be pitied. It's foolishness. In fact, if you don't believe that God is always victorious, if you don't believe Jesus rose from the grave, if you don't believe Jesus is king, I would just encourage you not to come to church. You're just wasting your time. Did the pastor just say that? Please come to church. I want you to hear God's good news. But the point is, if you're someone that professes and and day after day, you're not living by faith, trusting in this victorious God. Let's look at verses 46 through 47. Our faith is founded in God's victory. This day the the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. (laughs) David tells us his motive so that all the Philistines will know that there is a God. That's our purposes. That's why we live, to reflect, to be salt, to be light into this world. Dependency on God is a prerequisite for knowing God. Self-reliance is always a roadblock on the narrow road of following Jesus. David wasn't like, look what I'm gonna bring to the table. I got stuff to bring to the table. No, David knew that God was good, that God was victorious, that God could be trusted. He was dependent upon God. And this is what the faith life is all about, dependency on God. So what is it going to look like today? What does it look like for you, this story, David and Goliath? Does it even have any effect in our lives? I think it does. I think it's significant in this way. God can be trusted. I wish there was a formula, do this, do this, do this, and you will have faith. I think we're wired that way as Westerners. Can I just encourage you as a pastor? God, I do believe. Will you help my unbelief? God, will you expose to me where I'm being self-dependent, where I'm trusting in my talents, my abilities, my plan? And God, will you help me? Will you help me to trust you? If you go back, as we wrap up, as you go back, Verse four, Goliath says, hey, I will fight your best guy and whoever wins, that army wins. So not everyone needs to die. So Goliath is called a champion and he calls out another champion. And for 40 days, the nation of Israel is afraid and will not send anyone out. And then David, who trusts in God's victory, who trusts in God's character, David steps up. And what this is, is it's a picture of Jesus, the champion. 
against Satan. One man, Jesus, the God man, fights the battle for all humanity and for all those who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. They will experience the victory. This this event that occurs so many years before Jesus, it's a foreshadowing of what is to come. And this battle, I want you to see this final end. Goliath is conquered. Goliath has lost. He's done. Go with me to 1752 and we'll be done. Check out what happens. They're terrified. The Israelites are terrified. David has won. And look what happens in 1752. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and they pursued the Philistines. (laughs) There's still a whole army they got to fight. It was just one dude. But all of a sudden, something's changed. The one dude is defeated. Here's Here's where this goes. Jesus is our champion, has conquered all sin. Sin is pictured by Goliath, a giant we cannot beat on our own. We have no chance. Jesus defeats him. And I'm just asking you, church, like the Israelites after Goliath was conquered, we are called to go out into the world to represent this king. The warfare, though, is different. We fight with love. We fight with forgiveness. We fight with humility. We fight by faith into this broken world. And you're like, man, those are some pretty weak weapons. <laughs> those weapons in this world, they will stand out. They will stand out. This is what the passage means when Jesus says, you are the light of the world and the salt of the world. You're to co and influence this world because Jesus is victorious. So it's simply this, and the band can come up. This morning, wherever you're at, and I know there's, In our church alone, there's tragic situations going on. But I need you to hear this. Your biggest battle is not cancer. Your biggest battle is not a pending divorce. Your biggest battle is not maybe a loss of a loved one. Those hurt, those are hard, those are real battles. But your biggest battle is gonna be will you trust God in light of those things? That's the battle. Will you put your faith in a good God? You see, this story of David and Goliath was always about God and his faithfulness and his greatness. And that God is still just as great as he's ever been. I'll be up front. If you'd like to talk more about this, there'll be elders, deacons. If you want to learn more about Jesus, what it means to follow the conquering king, we would love to talk to you. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love, your goodness, your mercy. Jesus, you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, we want to worship you. We want to honor you. And then you said, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God, will you give us a renewed purpose, a a renewed understanding, or maybe a first-time understanding that you have redeemed us to reflect you and to prepare for this coming kingdom. God, will you use bedrock in that way? Will you help us to be one? Will you use your church around the world to be unified under the name of Jesus for the glory of God that many would come to faith as we anticipate and eagerly wait your return? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.